Welcome to the Fed Life Podcast with Dan Seip from Serving Those Who Serve. In this podcast, Dan draws from years of financial experience to help federal employees overcome challenges that every Fed can relate to. Join us for this journey as we reach, teach, and serve to help you make the right financial decisions. Now, on to the show. And hello and welcome to this episode of the FedLife Podcast. I am your host, Dan Seip. Additionally, I'm the branch manager here at Serving Those Who Serve and Lee Seip and Associates. And I will begin today, as I always do, saying thank you. Thank you for taking the time to listen. And another thank you. I've gotten some really nice notes over the last couple of weeks that have come in through our main mailbox uh, at swserve.com saying that you like the podcast. So that really means a lot. Ed and I, uh, Ed and I put a lot into these, so that's always glad, always glad to hear that. So thank you for that. Uh, and above all, thank you for your service. You don't hear it enough. You will always hear it here. And as you might guess, Ed Zerndorfer is back with us again. Once more, the guru is here to help us with our ongoing mission to reach, teach, and serve you. And as I always have to, to keep my compliance department happy, I have to say at the outset that the opinions of our guest Ed Zerndorfer are not the opinions of Ram James is serving this serve. This podcast is presented for information only and not intended to be taken as advice. All listeners can, should consult their personal advisors before taking any action. And if you don't have a personal advisor, hit us up at stwserve.com. We will do what we can to help you. And once again, we are following Ed's FedZone articles so that we've got more than one way to reach you and teach you and be of service to you. And today's topic, I think, is one that's going to be a really big help. So I'm going to ask everybody to share this one because in our practice, working with Feds, we really do encounter this a lot. And I was really happy when, uh, when I saw Ed was writing about it. And that has to do with part-time service because we do encounter an awful lot of Feds that when they have kids or, or one thing or another, may not work a full-time stretch during their career. And they don't think about it until it comes time to start calculating pensions and, and that sort of thing. So we do see it a lot. This will mirror Ed's FedZone article, and you can find that at fed-zone.com or at scwserve.com. Very, very important that you grab that article and read it because there are always some really, 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 really good tables and examples in there. So Ed, part-time service is a little more common than a lot of people would think, isn't it? Yes, uh, Dan, I want to point out, I, uh, I've been doing these seminars now, webinars for close to now 25 years, mm -hmm. and invariably one or two people when I'm doing retirement seminars, whether it's CSRS or FERS or both, I get at least three or four people who come up to me or ask me, um, I'm just wondering, I've worked part-time during my career. Will that have any effect on my benefits? Will it have any effect on when I can retire? And these mm -hmm. questions are still coming up during the webinars sure. or the questions that are being sent in and serving those who serve. Uh, as you know, serving those who serve uh, has this uh, email address where you can send questions. You know, you attend yep. a webinar and you get some leftover questions. And every it never fails. We get those questions about part-time service. I just sure. want to point out, Dan, that we have two um, uh, Fed Zone columns dealing with part-time service too. Uh, yep. The, the first one dealt with um, service uh, in terms of retirement eligibility and com and uh, computation of one's annuity, um, and the mm -hmm. second one deals with actual other benefits like health insurance and and what you have to pay for health insurance if you're a part-time employee, what's going to happen after you retire. So that it, was, it was divided into two separate uh, Fed Zone columns that appeared uh, very recently. Yep. And uh, I read them both, folks, and they are excellent. They are excellent. So in your first article, you begin with the definitions for part-time. Let's start there because people might be thinking, hmm, what if that affects me? Uh, yes, it's very important to know what part-time service is. It's defined as any actual service performed on a less than full-time basis. I, best, I think the best way to describe this, Dan, is we think about working a 40-hour week. Mm -hmm. well, in the federal government, you have a two-week pay period that consists of 80 hours. So mm -hmm. if one is working less than 80 hours in a given pay period, they're considered to be um, – part-time employees. Now, they're still considered to be permanent employees. We have to differentiate between a temporary employee versus a permanent employee. We're talking okay. about employees who are permanent, permanent mm -hmm. employees. 
and they're working less than full time. They might be working, let's say, 40 hours a pay period. So that would be considered a half time basis. They might be working um, uh, 60 hours a pay period. So they're three quarters time. So that's mm -hmm. how it's defined as a part time employee. They're still entitled to all the benefits that a full time employee is, everything, including retirement uh, benefits, uh, but they're just not working full time. Mm hmm. And, uh, and you actually add a couple of qualifiers in there. For example, you said it's not limited to, to just career part-time service. It, it doesn't include uh, WAE and that it does count for retirement. Why don't you take us through those? Because that was pretty interesting. Um, the, yes, Dan. The definition is not limited to just part-time career employment. I was talking about being a permanent employee. But it also mm -hmm. includes temporary time. For example, mm -hmm. you may have been um, working for a federal agency um, uh, on a temporary basis. Let's say back in the 80s, maybe you worked uh, over, over a couple summers uh, for a national, uh, for a national, at a national park, but mm -hmm. you were not working 40, uh, 80 hours a pay period. You were working 40 hours a period, 40 hours a pay period. Mm -hmm. Well, if if uh, part uh, if you are a permanent employee and you had prior temporary service, you're allowed to make a deposit for that and get credit for that temporary time. Mm. The same thing is true if you worked on a, as a part-time temporary employee, and now you, you, when you became a full-time permanent employee, you could make a deposit for that as well. We talk mm -hmm. about, we have, we have a, a separate uh, Fed Zone columns on, on, temp on making deposits, and I encourage employees who are, who are now thinking, gee, I remember when back in, in the early 80s, late 70s, I was working part-time sure. on a temporary basis. Is it too late to make that deposit? And the answer is absolutely not. You'll get credit for that. Yep. So um, it's never too late to make a deposit. Okay, so we know that we can, we can use this. So let's dig into the effect that part-time service has on retirement eligibility. And folks, I'll, I'll say it again, be sure to visit the Fed Zone, uh, fedheismanzone.com and, and read Ed's article on this because you know I, I read them obviously in, in preparation for this and the examples really do uh, make all the difference. So, so now Ed, the time counts, tell us how. I have some wonderful news for anybody listening out there um, who ever worked on a, on a part-time basis. And this is where people's eyes light up. Mm -hmm. And the and here's the news that if you ever during your federal career ever worked part time, mm -hmm. let's say half time, three quarters mm -hmm. time, as a result of your part time service, you do not repeat, do not have to work any longer in mm -hmm. order to be eligible to retire. What I'm saying is, Dan, is that part time service, as long as you were contributing to your retirement system first, let's say first. Uh, I don't know of anybody out there who is CSRS, but uh, sure. if, if they, most people now are FERS. But if any time during your federal career you work part-time, less than 80 hours of pay period, as a result of your part-time service, you do not have to work any longer to make up the fact that you did not work full-time. This really, really jumps, this really makes people perk up. Really? Oh, absolutely. Work any longer? I thought absolutely. because I was... Because I was working 10 years half time, uh, I was working 40 hours a period for 10 years, that would mean I'd have to work another 10 more years to make up for it. The answer mm -mm. is no, no, absolutely not. Now, there is some bad news coming along down the way. Don't, don't spend the money yet, because we were going to explain <laughs> what, 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 what's going to happen, what's going to happen in the terms of computing your FERS annuity. We'll talk about that in a few moments. I'm well, sure. that's, that's, that's a great segue. So, but, but go ahead and finish your thought. But again, I just wanted to make that very clear because, uh, you know, the people who usually ask, they come up to me and say, oh, darn it, I, had, I worked uh, 10 years part-time. Gee, now I was, I'm, I'm, I'm turning, I'm, I got, with, including that part-time service, I got 30 years of service. I just turned age 57, and now you're, now, but as what you're, what you're implying is, before we, before I mention giving the good news, that I'm going to have to work till 67. 
they can't right. make up that part-time service? And the answer is no. You still can nope. retire at age 57 with 30 years of service, even though 10 years of that was working half time. One so, counts as one. So it, it counts because as long, the key is, Dan, whether you're working full time or you're working part time, uh, if you're con you are a permanent employee, you are contributing every pay date, in this yep. case to the FERS Retirement Disability Fund. And the same amount of money is coming out of your paycheck to contribute every pay date to the FERS Retirement and Disability Retirement System. That's your contribution and your agency is, 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 match, is, is more than matching it so that you're able to retire. Gotcha. Okay, so we know, we know it counts and how that works. Now let's get into uh, to the calculation. How does, that, how does that impact the annuity calculation? So show us the money, Ed. Give us, give us the three steps. Now we're going to get a little complicated, Dan. And this is where every, I encourage everyone, please read that, that column that came out. Yes, uh, that came out on, on uh, I think on August the 11th, August 11th, about two weeks ago, it came out. Um, yep. And and there's a section in that in that in that column that's it's entitled "Effect of Part-Time Service on a FERS Annuity Computation." Yep. An individual, a FERS employee, has met the age, the minimum age, and minimum service requirement to retire. And included that minimum service is all the years he, he or she worked full time and worked part time, and now they've reached that age. So they decide to retire, and when they retire, they're going to get their again. I'm going to use the FERS annuity. Well, the fa the fact is that the fact that 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 that, that the, the fact that they were working part time will affect their annuity computation. And mm -hmm. This is how this is done. Something is, something is calculated by OPM who does, who does the calculation. OPM does the calculation of your annuity, the final calculation. OPM has to calculate what is called a proration factor, a proration factor, yep. which is nothing more than a ratio of the total number of hours a FERS employee worked during his or her career, including full-time and part-time, divided by the full-time equivalent number of hours they would work. For example, if somebody worked 40, uh, 30 years full-time, they would have worked, according to OPM's calendar, 2,087 hours for the, during their, every, per year for 30 years, whatever that comes mm -hmm. out to be, 30 times 2,087. So probably it was that about 600,000 something. And the ratio would be, and the, and the numerator in this ratio would be the actual hours worked. So if the person worked 20 years full-time, we're going to multiply 20 times 2,087 hours, add to that 10 years of half-time, so that's 10 times 1,043. And I'm not going to do the math here, certainly. But you see the fact is that this proration factor is going to be less than 1. That's yep. one. It might, it might be 80. It might be 70%. It might be 80%. It might be 90%. I want to point something else out, Dan. Um, you're talking to someone who retired 15 years ago under under um, under CSRS. It's, it's the same. It's the same idea. During the last three years of my federal career, I worked. I worked um, half time. I worked 40 hours of pay period. Mm -hmm. I, I think you want to know the reason? Because I was sure. taking time off. I was taking time off to do retirement mm -hmm. seminars at federal agencies. I, <laughs> I, 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 I couldn't. I could. I could not do a full time schedule, um, and um, and um, my my agency was saying, you know, you're burning a lot of leave here. So why don't you just work half time? It's a lot easier. And I did. And I did. So the last gotcha. three years of my federal service. The last three years of my federal service, from 2002 through 2005. Um, I was working half time, and it turned out that my proration factor was was about ninety four percent, ninety four percent. And I'm going okay. to explain where, where this proration factor is going to come into play right here in a moment. But the fact is that um, um, even though you're getting credit for the part time services as full time service for as far as retirement uh, eligibility and and, for, and and is concerned. Um, there is going to be effect on your annuity, and which we'll explain here in a minute using this proration factor. Mm -hmm. So, a person retires with part-time service, um, and they and they and they retire, and OPM 
calculates the annuity. And in calculating the annuity, they're going to use one's years of service as if they were, full, again, full-time. Mm-hmm. They're going to use the person's, uh, calculate the person's high three average salary. Now, what is the high three average salary? It is the, high, it is the highest three consecutive years of uh, uh, salary, the average of the, high, of the highest three consecutive years of salary. It's an average. Mm-hmm. For most mm-hmm. people, that's the last three years of federal service. Sure. And the, and the question comes up, well, wait a minute. Like my case, I was working half-time during my last three years. Oh, my salary, my high three average salary would not be, you know, would it only be, you know, it's only a half-time. They're going to use that half-time, that, 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 that half-time salary? And the answer is no. OPM will calculate the high three average salary as if it, the employee had worked full-time, had worked full-time during those years. You'll see where this probation factor is, where we're headed here. Gotcha. So, OPM is calculating the high three average salary based on as if the person had worked full time, a full time salary. Mm-hmm. And then once they have the, um, the, 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 um, the high three average salary, they multiply by what's called accrual factor. For every year of service you have, you get a percentage of your high three average salary. So, in my case, yep. I was CSRS. I was CSRS. So uh, for every year of service I, was, I had, I got 2% of my high three average salary. Let's say my high three average salary was $100,000, Dan. Yep. I, ha- I had about 30 years of service. So 30 times 2% times um, 100000 is, according to my math here, $60,000. Yep. $60,000. So is that my starting annuity? The answer is no, because this proration factor. I said a proration. few months ago, my... My probation factor was ninety-four um, percent. So if you take ninety-four percent of sixty thousand, that will be my starting CSRS annuity. So I'm losing about six percent of my annuity because I worked half time during my last three years. This is gotcha. a very simple example. I have another. I have. I think I have one or two examples, and I'm looking here. Yep, um, you sure do. And um, to make it a lot clearer. I think if individuals listening today will read those um, those um, two examples, I think it'll be a lot clearer. Um, actually, I, I think it's just one here, one example, uh, a fellow named Matt who retired at age 57. And I think when you read the example, it'll be a lot clearer how this works. Gotcha. And... Uh... And, and Matt is not an actual person. Uh, Ed, Ed picks names like uh, the Weather Service picks hurricane names. So he rotates through, uh, rotates through all the names. So Different, 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 but both sexes, by the way. I don't, yep, I don't exactly. Think. Yep. So before I move from eligibility to annuity calculations, Ed, do you have any, uh, any tips or best practices you have for, for feds as they go through the careers for, you know, making sure they document these things and that sort of thing? Well, um, it's a good idea. It's a good idea that if you are working part time, um, mm-hmm. and for one reason or another you have to work part time, um, and you find find that in, in the course of working part time that you actually can actually go back to full time, and you'll say, eh, it's not worth it. I'm only going to be working a couple more years." It is worth it. It is worth mm-hmm. it. Sure. Because um, you you want you don't you you want that proration factor to be as close to 100 percent as possible. So Absolutely. Don't, 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 don't hesitate. Do not hesitate. Do not hesitate. Do not hesitate um, to go back to full time if all possible. And um, if, if it's if it still turns out, if it still turns out, you know, you, you, you get you get a, you're thinking about you're eligible to retire and you get an annuity estimate from from um, from um, HR and you're yep. not satisfied with your annuity estimate, then, then, then decide not to retire. Keep working because by keeping, and especially if you're going to continue to work full time, because that proration factor will increase, meaning your starting um, annuity will be greater. Yep. Also, also I didn't mention this, that like, like a full-time employee, a part-time employee retires, gets credit for all unused sick leave in, for purposes of computing their annuity. You continue to work, you'll accrue more sick leave. That will add to the amount of your annuity, the calculation of your annuity, 
And if you go back to full time, you will start accruing the four hours. In the next segment, we're going to talk about the effect of benefits, how your other benefits are affected by part-time employment. But I will tell you that when you're working part-time, you're not getting the full accrual of annual leave and sick leave. Gotcha. So, so it, it, you, one should not hesitate. One should not hesitate to go back to full-time. It is well worth it. Okay. All right. Again, once again, Ed, nice segue. So we're going to move on to the second article where we're going to talk about the effect part-time service has on other components, such as annual and sick leave, TSP, life and health, long-term care, dental and vision. So, yep, folks, there's a lot of moving parts to getting to a comfortable retirement. That's why we have so many webinars every month, because there's a lot to learn. So, Ed, let's dig in. Take us through how part-time might impact sick and annual leave. Okay. Let's start off with annual leave, Dan. Okay. Um, as, as federal employees know, when you're in the first, years, first three years of your federal service, um, you normally accrue four hours every two weeks for the first three years of your federal service. I say normally. I say it because when you came into federal service, if you had prior temporary time, prior federal service, if you, were, you served in the military um, and you're not a military retiree for active duty, you get credit for accrual leave, for accrual leave purposes when it comes to annual leave. But let's just say... During the first three years of, of your federal service, you accrue every two weeks four hours of annual leave. When you mm -hmm. reach year four through the end of year 14, you get six hours every two weeks. And when you reach um, year 15, you hit the biggie. You get eight hours of annual leave every two weeks. Well, that is true if you are a full-time employee. If you are part-time, let's say you're working half-time, mm -hmm. then you're going to get 50% of what you are normally entitled to when it comes to a leave, for a, a, um, a annual leave accrual. For example, gotcha. suppose you're in year, you're in year 16, year of service, you can, and, you, um, and you ha you're normally as a full-time employee, you get eight hours, and you're working half-time, you, you will accrue four hours of annual leave every two weeks. Four mm -hmm. hours of annual leave every two weeks. Um, and... Um, that will continue as long as you are part-time. We talked a few moments ago about going back to full-time. Well, if you go back to full-time, then you go back to the eight hours. That gotcha. is when it comes to annual leave. When it comes to sick leave, everybody, everybody accrues four hours of sick leave every two weeks. I say everybody, everybody who's full-time. If you're working half-time, you will accrue two hours of annual leave. Um, uh, of a sick leave every two weeks. If you're working mm -hmm. three quarters time, you will accrue three hours of sick leave every two weeks as long as you continue to work uh, this part time. Okay, so we've got that button down. Now we're moving on and following your article, we're going to TSP. And the math is fairly clear here, except for the fact that somebody could work part-time and still have the same maximum contribution, they'd just be kicking in a higher percentage, correct? That is correct. Uh, just to review the rules for the TSP, um, mm -hmm. they, they take for this year. Every year the TSP has a limit as far as how much an employee, full-time or part-time, a, a, a permanent employee, can contribute from their salary into the TSP. Now, these are not TSP rules. These are IRS rules um, mm -hmm. because the TSP um, is a considered to be a is a defined contribution plan. It's not a qualified plan, Dan. I want to point that out. It is not a qualified retirement plan. It has many of the features of a qualified uh, reti qualified retirement plan, like a 401k plan, but not entirely. Mm -hmm. There are some differences. But here's what everyone has to keep in mind. You are limited what you can contribute to the TSP every year. Um, if you're younger than age 50, the most you can put into the TSP during 2021 is $19,500. $19,500 that, mm -hmm. that can go into the traditional TSP, it can go into the raw TSP, or a combination traditional and raw TSP, but the total amount cannot exceed $19,500. 
during 2021. We'll see what's going to happen in 2022, but that's the limit this year. Um, mm -hmm. If you are a FERS employee, um, you're getting an automatic 1% of gross pay contribution, whatever your SF50 mm -hmm. salary is, you get an automatic 1% of gross pay contribution into your traditional TSP account. Um, and you get a maximum match of 4% from your agency if you are contributing at least 5% to your TSP account. That 1% auto, automatic contribution and 4% match is not part of the 19500 That's in addition mm -hmm. to. Now, everything I just said, Dan, applies to a full-time or a part-time employee. There's no gotcha. differentiation here in terms of how much a full-time or part-time employee can put in. Yes, you're right that if the, if the employee has a lower salary as a result of being part-time, they're going to have to put a higher percentage of that salary into the TSP because their, their salary is lower. It's as simple sure. as that. Also, those employees who are at least age 50 as mm -hmm. of the last day of the year can, do, can, can contribute in 2021 – something called a catch-up contribution, maximum amount is $6,500. Again, mm -hmm. no differentiation between full-time and part-time. Gotcha. There's no, just no differentiation. The only thing is you got to put a little more percentage of their salary in to do that catch-up contribution. Okay. So the impact is kind of not so much. So good to know. Now let's move on to FEHB. Because in, in reading your article, it's looking like the there's an impact, but it's more while a Fed is working than in retirement. Is that correct? Uh, that is absolutely correct, Dan. And I again, I will relate my own experience. It's just like I, I, I mentioned last three years of my federal service, I was contributing to the TSP. I was not getting any matching because I was CSRS, but I was, put, I was putting in the same amount to the TSP when I was working part-time as I was working full-time. Mm -hmm. When it comes to health insurance, and then we'll talk next about the government life insurance, there is a difference in terms okay. of what the employee has to contribute. Yep. Just a, gen a general review, Dan, of the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program. This is a group-sponsored group health insurance program sponsored by the federal government in which yep. all career employees, full-time and part-time, can participate they can they, they they can cover themselves and members of their family, and um, they as you know they can uh, choose any plan they want. They can change their plan during the open season. The mm -hmm. rule is that in, an employee, a full time employee, um, con uh, is is contributing twenty five to twenty eight percent of the total premium cost for whatever plan they're in. The twenty five to twenty eight percent. And their agency is contributing the other 72 to 75 percent of the of the total cost of the premium for that plan, as mm -hmm. long as the employee is working from the is working for the federal government. The employee's contribution is being deducted from their paycheck, from their paycheck, mm -hmm. okay, um, from their gross salary. Now. Again, it makes no difference what type of plan the employee's in. It could be a fee-for-service plan. It could be a, a preferred provider organization plan, PPO plan. It could be an HMO. It could be a high-deductible health insurance plan. It makes no difference. Gotcha. The, the employees pay, on average, 25 to 28% of the premiums. I say 25 to 28% if they are a full-time employee. But if they're a part-time employee, they're going to have to pay more. The amount of their health insurance premiums that they're paying as a, as a, is, uh, as a part-time employee is prorated in proportion to the percentage of their full-time service, in, to the percentage of a full-time service employee. Let's do an example. I think it's a lot easier, Dan, if we do an example. And this is, okay. comes right out of my column. Yep. We have someone named Lucy. We had Matt. Now it's only fair that we have Lucy. Lucy. Absolutely. Lucy is a part-time career employee. She is enrolled in the FEHB program, and she works half-time, 40 mm -hmm. hours per week. Since Lucy works half-time, the agency's FEHB program premium contribution, Lucy's agency is going to be contributing not 72 
to 75% of the premiums, but half of that, 36 to 38% of the total premium. So therefore, Lucy's share of the premium is going to be the other 62 to 64%. Gotcha. So Lucy has to pay more. And I get this question, I get this question all the time. Ooh, that's terrible. When I go into retirement, I was told that as long as I'm a participant in the Federal Employees Health Insurance Program, at least for the last five years of my federal service, I get to keep this benefit in retirement in which the federal government continues to pay its share of 72 to 75 percent of the premiums. This is after I retire. Mm -hmm. Dan, I got to tell you, I had I have a prayer every night. I add to my nightly prayers. And one of the and that prayer is this. Thank you, good Lord, as a federal retiree, that the federal government is paying seventy two to seventy five percent of my FEHB premiums for myself and my wife. This is a yep. blessing from heaven. This is a blessing. Okay? So the employee says, Ooh, but I worked I worked. Like Lucy said, let's say she's working half time at the last five years. She's going she's gonna to say, well, what's going to happen when I retire? Do I have to pay more for my health insurance? And the answer is no, because once you retire, then you switch over to what it normally is, 25 to 28%. The fact that you worked half time and you had to pay more for your health insurance has no effect when you retire. Boy, That's a big that advantage. Brings, that brings a sigh of relief when, the, when, the, when I tell people that. <laughs> I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Okay, let's move on to the Federal Employee Group Life Insurance Program, Fegley. Um, looks like this primarily impacts basic life. Am I correct there, Ed? Yes, I think we should review, Dan, what the, the Federal Employees Group Life Insurance Program is. It's, sure. Again, it's a, gr it's a group-sponsored life insurance program. Uh, it's sponsored by the federal gov government. It's, uh, I think, administered by Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. Cor and yep. there, are two, there are two parts to Fegley. One is called the basic insurance amount, which is an employee's salary uh, round, uh, rounded up. It's adjusted a little bit. It's her salary. Um, and then there's the optional coverages. Option A is called standard, a flat $10,000. Option yep. B is something called multiple of salary, um, multiple of their SF50 salary, one, two, three, four, or five times. And then yep. there's something called option C, which is for family coverage for your spouse and children under the age of 22. In terms of cost, Dan, employees pay the full premium cost of the optional coverages. There's mm -hmm. no government contribution, meaning that if you are a part-time employee, that's no big thing. You're paying the same premium as if you were to be full-time. You're not, there's no, there's no difference here. Okay. But when it comes to the, 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 what's called the basic insurance amount, BIA for short, mm -hmm. the federal government pays one third of the premium cost for full-time career employees. The federal government contribution towards part-time employees, again, is prorated in proportion to the percentage of a full-time, sir, full, to a full-time employee. They are, they, that, 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 that who has a full-time, is working full-time. Again, mm -hmm. let's go do another example. Dan, I think it's a lot easier if we do examples here. Okay? Sure. Uh, poor Lucy here. Lucy. Yep. Um, she's also enrolled in the Fagley Basic Insurance. She does not yep. have optional coverage. Uh, she only has the basic. Lucy works half-time, 40 hours per pay period. The federal government's contribution to her basic insurance amount is therefore 50% of the total one-third that the government contributes to the cost of a basic insurance amount. So 50% of one-third is one-sixth. The government's paying one-sixth of Lucy's premiums uh, for the basic insurance amount, and, th and Lucy therefore has to pay the other five-sixths of the premium cost for her basic insurance Fegley coverage. And that gotcha. will continue as long as Lucy is, is working half time. Like the, like the um, health insurance, like the, like the, uh, again, the life insurance, employee says to me, is it really worth going back to full time? Yes. Yes. <laughs> 
Because, Absolutely. Because when you get back to full time, the government continues to pay its full amount. It's well worth it. Even if it's just a year, it's worth it. Sure. And we round out the article, Ed, with two voluntary programs, uh, long-term care and uh, dental and vision benefits. And from, from what I saw, from what you wrote, from my own experience, doesn't look like there's any real impact to that for part-time service because that's a pay-as-you-go uh, and, and you're picking up the whole cost yourself. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. There is no federal government, no agency, no federal government contribution to the cost of long-term care insurance. You, 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 it's a group, uh, group uh, long-term care insurance company run by the LTC partners. You can find out information about the program by going to www.ltcfeds.com. I'd like to make a plug here for um, a... Um, a, uh, uh, a one of our newest webinars, uh, Dan. For absolutely, to serve. It's absolutely. Long -term, understanding long term care and long term care insurance. We're going to have our first one on the webinar on September the seventeenth. September seventeenth. Yep. Just go to www.stwserve.com. Just click on webinars. You'll see it's already. I think it's already up there. If you want to sign yep. up, it's it free. Is. Great information. Um, as you always say, um, I, doing these webinars with my colleagues, Jim Meyer and Matt Kramer, it's always a pleasure. Absolutely. So, um, but in terms of the federal program, you, you, the federal loan insurance, you, if you go to www.ltcfeds.com, uh, that's where you get information about the program. Here's the most important things you got to know about the federal loan term care insurance program. Number one. It's not a guarantee you're going to get it. You have to apply for it. You have to be approved by the LTC partners. There is underwriting. Um, also, if you are approved, um, that um, you're paying the full cost of the premiums. The full cost of the premiums, there is no federal government contribution. So whether you are full-time, part-time, makes no difference. You're going to be paying the same. You'll be paying the, uh, the premium, whatever type of um policy you received, the type of benefits you signed up for and got, got approved, and that is true when you're working. It's going to also be true after you retire. Gotcha. And, and ditto for the government's uh, dental group dental and vision insurance program. It's called the Federal, Federal Employee Dental and Vision Insurance Program, known as FedVIP. There's yep. separate dental insurance, separate vision insurance that you would sign up for, uh, during any open season, um, and it's there's uh, there's information on the website www.benefeds www.benefeds.com. Something to think about for those of you who are thinking about buying some dental and vision insurance during the next open season, which will be in November. I'm sure we're going to have lots of lots of information out there about that. F f definitely fed zone columns and at least one or two podcasts as we always do during the, yep. during the benefits open season. But here's the point. Uh, whether you are an empl full-time employee, part-time employee, whether you are a retiree, you pay the full cost of the premium. The government, again, does not contribute anything to the premium cost of the dental or, the dental or vision insurance. Yep. Completely voluntary. Complete. Okay, Ed, great stuff. Um, as I always say, you know, I want to thank you on behalf of the feds. Uh, no one else generates as much content as you do. We're, we're, we're proud to be a, a chassis for, for getting it out there. You're not going to find, you're not going to find this much Ed anywhere else. You know, we are, we are all Ed all the time sometimes, and we're happy to, happy to do that. Folks, that is a wrap. Uh, we are serving those who serve. Uh, again, share this. Share, share this with some people because there's a lot of part-time work out there, and this can really help people get prepared in advance to, to know what they're going to need to do. Uh, be sure to subscribe to this podcast on our YouTube channel as well as Spotify. Uh, check us out on Twitter and LinkedIn. And as Ed mentioned, we've got those live webinars going every week. Uh, I will go so far as to say you're going to be hard-pressed not to find a date that'll work for you because we really pride ourselves on, uh, on having a bunch of them. And so just go to that STWS website, which is stwserve.com. You'll see the webinar button, click it. That'll take you to, uh, to the registration page. Yep. 
Ed Zerndorfer will come to you. You don't, you don't have to leave your house, you don't have to leave your office, whatever, whatever works best for you. He's there to reach you where you are, teach you where you are, and we're there to serve you where you are. So sign up for one, sign up for all, share it with friends. Uh, be sure to read Ed every month in the Fed Zone. It's every single week. There's always good stuff in there. We cover most of it here, but every now and again, there's some extra stuff that goes in. So, so it is all indexed. It's searchable. You can find it. So to wrap it up, for Ed, the crew at Serving the Serve, and me, Dan Seip, Good luck, Godspeed, and above all, it's your fed life. So make it a great one, because you deserve it. Stay well, everybody. We are out. Thank you for listening to the Fed Life Podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of serving those who serve or Raymond James. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Securities offered through Raymond James Financial Services Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through Raymond James Financial Services Advisors Incorporated. Serving those who serve is not a registered broker or dealer and is independent of Raymond James Financial Services. Raymond James is not affiliated with and does not endorse the opinions or services of the quoted professionals or their respective organizations.